today's lecture on uh, eukaryotic gene expression, we are going to actually study the one important aspect of eukaryotic transcription factors. That is, we are going to understand how eukaryotic transcription factors go and bind to specific DNA sequences. We are going to focus on what is called as the DNA binding domain of eukaryotic transcription factors. Now, just before I start, I just want to recapitulate what we have studied so far. So far, what we have studied is, we have studied about eukaryotic RNA polymerases, how the eukaryotic RNA polymerases 1, 2 and 3 actually go and bind to specific promoters and activate the transcription of messenger RNA and make messenger RNA, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA and so on and so forth. Then I told you, in order for eukaryotic RNA polymerase to bind to a protein coding gene promoter, you require what are called the general transcription factors, there are what are called core promoter elements and the binding of the general transcription factors and to the core promoter sequences actually is responsible for initiation of transcription. And I also mentioned to you how there are variations within the core promoter elements and there are also variants of general transcription factors and this itself can contribute to differential gene regulation. Then in the last class, we actually told, uh, discussed it is not just the core promoter elements, there are also what are called as proximal promoter elements, distal promoter elements, enhancer sequences which are present much much upstream of the core promoter region. And there are what are called as sequence specific DNA binding proteins or upstream activators or transcription factors which actually can bind in a sequence specific manner to these various promoter elements and this binding ultimately enhances the rate of transcriptionization of eukaryotic protein coding genes. And I also briefly mentioned this knowledge that there are strong promoters, there are weak promoters, there are inducible promoters, there are constitutive promoters. This knowledge has actually helped in a what is called as a billion dollar biotechnology industry because today using this knowledge, we can now make any protein of our interest in any, ex any expression system of our choice. You can make your protein in bacteria, yeast, insect cells, mammalian cells, plant cells, anywhere by simply taking the gene and putting under a promoter of your choice and putting them inside the particular organism or cells, you can actually make your recombinant protein production. Okay. Now, in this lecture today, we are going to now discuss how exactly the eukaryotic trans transcription factors go and bind to specific DNA. Remember, there are two important things when you talk about transcription activation. In one case, the eukaryotic transcription factor should go and bind to a specific DNA sequence. And then once it recognizes specific DNA sequence and binds, it has to activate transcription. So, the transcription factors <coughs> should contain two important domains. One is called as a DNA binding domain and a transcription activation domain. Now, by studying a number of eukaryotic transcription factors, people have now found out that these two functions are actually modular in nature. That is, the transcription factors contain two modular domains, one is called as the DNA binding domain and this is a transcription activation domain. And these domains are actually separable. In fact, you can take the DNA binding domain of one transcription factor and replace it with the DNA binding domain of another transcription factor and now make the transcription factor recognize the DNA sequence of the other one. So, you can take the DBD of, DBD of transcription factor A and replace it with the DBD of B and now the transcription factor A will now start recognizing the do the function of transcription factor B. Similarly, you can swap the DNA binding domains or transcription activation domains between two different transcription factors. This knowledge has actually made a very important contribution for understanding the function of a number of uh, eukaryotic genes. We will discuss about this little bit later. So, remember for a transcription factor to function in eukaryotic cells, it should contain a DNA binding domain for interaction with specific DNA sequences and should contain transcription activation domain with which it can interact with proteins which are the part of the general transcription machinery or either directly or with what are called as co-activators, co-repressors and so on which we will discuss in the uh, later stages. The other important uh, uh, feature that you have to recognize when you talk about transcription factor function is that many transcription factors actually bind as dimers. Now, in the previous class, I gave you two examples. One is the glucocorticoid receptor, another is nuclear factor kappa B. Now, the glucocorticoid receptor actually binds to DNA as a homodimer. That means, two monomers of glucocorticoid receptors come together and they are dimerized and then they go and bind to the DNA. Where in the case of NF kappa B, I give an example where two different subunits. So, it is heterodimer. Actually, the heterodimer now goes and binds to DNA. So, in order for the transcription factors to function in many cases like glucocorticoid receptor and NF kappa B, it is not enough if they just have a DNA binding domain and transcription activation domain, they should also have a domain for dimerization. So, they should have a dimerization domain for binding to each other. 
Now, this dimerization domain as shown in this particular cartoon can either facilitate dimerization of the two DNA binding domains or it can facilitate dimerization of the two transcription activation domains. That means, this dimerization domain can be present either within the DNA binding domain or it can be present in the transcription activation domain and the function of this dimerization domain is to bring the two monomers together. It can be either two monomers of the same time then it becomes a homodimer or it can be two different monomers then it becomes a heterodimer. The other important thing which again we discussed in the previous class is many transcription factors like glucocorticoids they also their function is modulated by certain small molecules these are called effector molecules. That means, I told you in the last class the glucocorticoid hormone has to go and bind to the glucocorticoid receptor and this binding of the ligand brings about a conformational change in the receptor. So, that it cannot interact with the HSP90 and then it, it results in the exposure of the nuclear localization signal therefore, it can go inside the nucleus and activate transcription. That means, the receptor also has a domain to which the small molecule can go and bind. So, the effector molecule in this case is glucocorticoid hormone has to go and bind to a specific region within the protein and therefore, these receptors as I show in this particular cartoon should also have a domain for binding to small effector molecules. So, in addition to the DNA binding domain and transcription activation domain, they must have a do many of the transcription factors have a domain for binding of these effector molecules and small molecules can actually go and bind to the specific effector molecule binding domain and bring about modulation of the transcription factor function. So, in addition to DNA binding domain and transcription activation domain, dimerization domain and effector binding domains are also very, very important parts of a eukaryotic transcription factor. <coughs> now, the important uh, function or uh, important criterion for a transcription factor function is transcription factor should bind DNA in a sequence specific manner. Now, there are three common features for most of the DNA binding proteins. Okay? You take any, any transcription factor, there are three important features you have to remember. One is when they bind DNA, they bind the major group of the B DNA, the B DNA. B DNA is the normal form of DNA which is present in the eukaryotic cells. You also have other kinds of DNA like Z DNA and so on and so forth. But remember, most of the transcription factors actually bind to B, B form of DNA. And when they form the B form of DNA, the B form of DNA contains what is called a major groove and minor groove. And most of the this DNA protein interactions involving transcription function activator function involves the major groove of the DNA. So, the alpha specific alpha helices of these transcription factors go and recognize specific bases in the major groove of the DNA, and as a result, the DNA protein interaction takes place, culminating in transcription activation. And usually the minor group of B DNA is generally too narrow to fit the entire alpha helices and therefore, most of the transcription modulatory functions involve major group of the beta form B form of DNA. Now, other important thing when you talk about transcription factor binding to the DNA, this does not actually involve disruption of base pairs of DNA. The DNA still remains double stranded, the base pairing of the two strands of DNA is not in fact is altered. So, the transcription factor binding to DNA does not really alter or disrupt the base pairs of DNA, but it actually distorts the conformation of the backbone of the DNA by actually bringing about binding of the double helix. Okay. So, this is how most of the transcription factors bind DNA and bring about uh, transcription activation. So, the important part function of the DNA binding domain of a transcription factor is to bring the transcription activation domain to close proximity to the uh, pre initiation complex which contains the general transcription factors and RNA polymerase 2. So, unless a transcription factor is brought into the vicinity of the promoter, these transcription factors cannot facilitate enhancement in the rate of transcription initiation. So, the major function of the DNA binding domain of a transcription factor is to bring the transcription factor to a specific region the promoter in such a way that the transcription activation domain of this transcription factor can now interact with general transcription factor and bring about transcription activation. Now, we need to spend some time to understand this DNA binding property of the transcription activators because it is based on the DNA binding domains that many transcription factors have been classified into different families. So, not all transcription factors bind DNA in the same manner. They contain very, very specific mechanisms by which they can go and bind to DNA in a sequence specific manner. So, transcription factors which bind DNA in a sequence specific manner contain characteristic DNA binding domains or DNA binding motifs. And in fact, based on the kind of DNA binding domain or motifs, eukaryotic transcription factors are classified into different families. So, you have for example, what are called as helix-style helix motifs, zinc finger proteins which contain zinc finger DNA binding motifs. 
you have what are called as leucine zipper motif uh, proteins which contain leucine zipper which are involved in sequence specific DNA recognition and have what are called as helix loops helix proteins in which the DNA recognition is brought about by what is called as a helix loop helix motif. There are a number of other motifs, but let us confine to these four motifs for the present. Now, the helix turn helix motif. Now, the helix turn helix motif was one of the most well studied motifs because this motif was initially identified in the DNA binding domain of bacteriophage depressors. So, when people started understanding uh, how the phage phage actually goes and by, uh, 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 regulates the expression of the uh, E. coli cells or the bacterial cells. They found the phage actually have certain negative regulators like repressors. You have lambda repressor, crow repressor, and so on and so forth, which actually bind to specific regions in the host genome and shut off the expression of either genes known as lysis, lytic phase, or lysogenic phase. And these repressors actually contain a DNA recognition motif, which is called as helix turn helix. So, this repressor contain two alpha helices, one that lies in the major blue of the DNA and other that lies at a angle or across the DNA. <coughs> two adjacent alpha helices separated by a turn of several amino acids enables the protein to bind DNA. So, these are the helix turn helix motif shown here. The helix turn helix motif cannot fold or function alone, but it is always part of a larger DNA binding domain and amino acids outside the helix turn helix motif are very important in regulating the DNA recognition and binding. So, helix turn helix motif is one of the first identified DNA sequence specific DNA recognition motifs in transcription factors and originally found in the prokaryotic uh, transcription regulators like the lambda, lambda repressor, crow repressor and so on and so forth. Now, a motif similar to helix turn helix motif is present in certain eukaryotic transcription factors and especially those transcription factors which play a very important role in the regulation of development. And the DNA binding domain in these proteins is called as the homeo domain. So, proteins are called as um, uh, Hox proteins and so on and so forth, which again we will discuss in detail when you talk about development regulation of gene expression. Suffice to know now that many transcription factors in eukaryotes, which play a very important role in development regulation of gene expression, they contain a DNA recognition motif, which is very similar to the helix turn helix motif of prokaryotic transcription factors and these are actually called as homeo domains. One example what I have shown here is that a transcription factor in Drosophila known as Anten Antenopedia which plays a very important role in uh, development it contains this particular helix turn helix kind of motif which is actually known as the homeo domain. So, the usually the C terminal domain uh, region of this uh, transcription factors contain this uh, homeo domain and uh, it contains about a 60 um, this homeo domain comprises about 60 amino acid motif. Okay? Now, the other important and most well studied uh, uh, DNA binding motif in eukaryotic transcription factor is what is called as a zinc finger motif. Now, a zinc finger motif is present in many eukaryotic transcription factors. Uh, it is called as a zinc finger because a zinc ion is coordinated between two cysteines and two histidine residues of a uh, in the amino acid sequence of a protein. So, for example, you have the histidine 1, histidine 2 here and you have the cysteine 1 and cysteine 2 here. So, you have C, C2, you have C2 H2. So, these two cysteine and two histidines actually coordinate a zinc atom and as a result this forms what is called as a zinc finger. So, a zinc atom actually interacts with two cysteine residues and two histo residues and these are actually called as C 2 H 2 zinc fingers. Now, the first report of such kind of a zinc finger motif being involved in a specific sequence specific DNA recognition was identified in a transcription factor called as T F 3 A in the frog Xenopus levis. So, this was the first zinc finger protein which was actually discovered. discovered. In fact, the TF3A contains multiple such zinc fingers and is involved in the recognition of the uh, 5 RNA gene promoter. And the number of zinc fingers in these transcription factors varies from 1 to uh, one to many. Mm. And this is exactly the uh, cartoon actually showing how exactly the two cysteines and two histidines actually coordinate with the zinc atom in these uh, zinc finger transcription factors. So, a C 2 H 2 zinc finger protein has a series of zinc fingers and the consensus sequence of a single zinc finger is shown here. You will have a cysteine about 2 to 4 amino acids x means any amino acid. Again you have a cysteine residue and you have again 3 amino acids again x means any amino acid a phenylalanine x 3 leucine x 2 his x 3 and his. So, you have C 2 H 2 separated by a specific number of amino acids. So, the interspersed cysteine and histidine residues covalently bind zinc atoms resulting in the folding the amino acids into loops known as zinc fingers. Now, let us exactly see how exactly this is formed. 
Here I give one example of a cartoon how actually a zinc finger of a transcription factor is formed. So, as I told you each zinc finger consists of approximately 23 amino acids with a loop of about 12 to 14 amino acids. You can see this is the 12 to 13 to 14 amino acids which actually form a loop and these are the two cysteines and two histidines here which actually coordinate with the zinc finger and this is the rest. Of, so, the, this is the amino terminus this is towards the amino terminus the protein comes here and goes like this and comes like this and goes like this. So, in this case we have two C 2 H 2 kind of a zinc fingers. So, it is a C 2 H 2 zinc finger protein. This is the actual amino acids here. So, you have actually a linker between the loops consists of about 78 amino acids. When you have multiple zinc fingers, you have about 78 amino acids loop between the zinc fingers. And the amino acids in the loop, these are the ones which are actually involved in sequence specific DNA recognition. Okay. So, here is an example this is the linear amino acid sequence, and you can see you have cysteine, two amino acid cysteine, then you have a loop this is the loop which is formed here and then again you have H 2 and these are the two H 2 residues here. So, C 2, C 2, H 2, H 2 and this is the loop and then we have a loop, uh, stretch of uh, amino acids here which are actually like a linker. Then you again you have C 2 which is shown here C 2 again this is the loop shown here and you have H 2, H 2. So, this is an example of a C 2 H 2 kind of a zinc finger uh, motif. Now, Today, zinc finger protein family is one of the largest transcription factor families. So, a number of uh, zinc finger kind of a transcription factors have been identified. So, I ask the question how do all these things do they recognize the same sequence or do they recognize different sequences? Now, although they have a basic structure in which the two cysteines and two histidines are conserved in all these zinc finger transcription factor proteins, but there are variations in the other amino acids. Here I give again for example, two examples where the underlined or the triangles actually show these are the amino acids which are different between these two zinc finger proteins. But the two cysteines and two histidines are conserved, but the other amino acids in the either loop region or the linker region of the zinc finger proteins can be different. And it is these differences in these loops that actually import differential recognition of DNA. So, this the for example, this zinc finger protein may recognize a DNA sequence which is completely different from the sequence recognized by them, although both of them contain same kind of zinc fingers. Okay. So, the amino acid differences in and around the C 2 H 2 motif actually contribute to differential DNA recognition of these zinc finger proteins. So, zinc finger proteins represent one of the major families of eukaryotic transcription factors including those belonging to the steroid, steroid hormone receptor family. For example, in the last class I told you we have what is called as a glucocorticoid receptor and glucocorticoid receptor is actually a member of the zinc finger transcription factor family. We will study in more detail how actually glucocorticoid receptor binds and wha what is the organization of zinc fingers a little bit later. So, one important thing you have to remember now when we talk about steroid hormone receptors is that the previous slide I told you the TF 3A contains what is called as a C 2 H 2 kind of a zinc finger where you have two cysteines and two histidines which are involved in the coordination of the zinc finger family zinc, uh, zinc atom. Whereas, in the case of proteins like steroid hormone receptors which are also sequence specific transcription factors instead of a C 2 H 2 you have what is called as C 2 C 2 kind of a zinc finger. So, the zinc atom is actually coordinated by four cysteines. So, you have C 2 loop and again 2 C 2 and these two cysteines actually coordinate the zinc atom. So, these belong to the C 2 C 2 type of zinc fingers whereas, the T F 3 is an example of the C 2 H 2 kind of a zinc fingers. So, the consensus sequence for this kind of a C 2 C 2 zinc fingers is you have the first cysteine residues separated by 2 amino acids, the next cysteine residues and then you have a 13 amino acids to actually form a loop, then you have another cysteine residue, 2 amino acids and next cysteine residue. So, this is the consensus sequence for the C 2 C 2 kind of a zinc fingers. Now, Studies in the case of steroid hormone receptors, Ex the zinc fingers in steroid hormone receptors have been extensively studied. Like I told you, steroid hormones means you have glucocorticoid hormone, progesterone, estrogen, and so on and so forth. Now, remember, each one of these hormones have a different physiological effect. Okay? That means, if these receptors, but all the whether you take an estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor or glucocorticoid receptor, they are all zinc finger proteins. So, that means although they are all zinc finger proteins, the genes which have to be activated by glucocorticoid receptor must be entirely different than the genes which have to be activated by progesterone or estrogen receptor because each one of them is a different physiological response. Now, how do these steroid hormone receptors despite all of them containing a zinc finger recognize different DNA sequences? Now, unless they recognize different DNA sequences, they cannot go and bind to different promoters and activate different sets of genes.
So, how is differential gene regulation brought about by steroid hormone receptors despite the fact that they are all zinc finger proteins? That is why I told you as I told in the, frame, in the previous uh, 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 slide, although they all contain the same zinc fingers, the amino acids in the base of the zinc finger are often different. So, these amino acid difference the base of the first zinc finger actually makes a glucocorticoid receptor recognize what is called as a glucocorticoid response element, whereas an estrogen receptor go and recognize an estrogen receptor response element. And there are differences between glucocorticoid response element and estrogen response element in terms of the sequence. And therefore, because of these amino acid differences in the base of the first zinc finger, a glucocorticoid receptor will go and only recognize a glucocorticoid response element, whereas an estrogen receptor will go and recognize only an estrogen response element. So, this is how differential regulation is brought about by these different members of the steroid hormone receptors. We will talk the exact mechanisms a little bit later when we have a one entire class on regulation by nuclear hormone receptors. What has been very interestingly shown is that by simply making one amino acid change in the base of the zinc finger of glucocorticoid receptor. That means, if you for let us say for example, this is a lysine residue. Okay? And let us say in the estrogen receptor instead of lysine, you have a leucine here. Now, if you now convert this lysine residue in glucocorticoid receptor into a leucine residue, you can make the glucocorticoid receptor into an estrogen receptor. What I mean is, now glucocorticoid receptor instead of now recognizing glucocorticoid response element will now start binding to an estrogen response element. So, the difference between whether a glucocorticoid receptor has to recognize a glucocorticoid response element or where an estrogen receptor has to recognize an estrogen response element is ultimately decided by a one amino acid which is present at the base of the first zinc finger. So, you can see at the physiological level you have two entirely different hormones. The physiological effects of a glucocorticoid hormone is entirely different from that of estrogen right, which means they have to activate totally different set of genes. But at the molecular level, you can see how finely the gene regulation is tuned. At the molecular level, the only difference between whether a glucocorticoid receptor has to bind a glucocorticoid response element or whether an estrogen receptor has to bind an estrogen response element is ultimately narrowed down to just one amino acid. So, if you change this one amino acid to that of estrogen receptor, you now glucocorticoid receptor will now start binding to estrogen response elements and it will be a big mess. Right? You will be in fact, that means, we will be activating genes estrogen response genes will be activated in response to glucocorticoids, which will be a big mess in the system. So, you can see at the molecular level such fine differences in the amino acid sequences and nucleotide sequences make a big difference at the physiological level. Now, the other important DNA binding motive that people have discovered in certain transcription factors like in the case of yeast there is a protein called GCN4 and in the case of uh, mammalian cell they have what called C June, FOS. Crab and so on and so forth. Again, do not worry about these terminologies, we will discuss in detail at later classes. Suffice to know that certain transcription factors in eukaryotes contain neither a helix turn motif nor a zinc finger, but they contain a different kind of a DNA binding motif, which is actually called as the basic leucine zipper or B zip. Now, this motif is slightly different from what we have discussed so far in the sense that this motif actually consists of two amphiphatic helices, one from each subunit interacting with each, with each other resulting in a left handed coil coil structure. Now, these are the two amphiphatic helix which I have shown here and very interesting here is that in which remember uh, when we are talking about these things, we, we assume that all these transform factors which contain these domains, they actually bind as dimers. It can be a homodimer or it can be a heterodimer but they bind as dimer and what actually this leucine zipper does is it actually facilitates dimerization. Okay? So, each one of these monomers have what are called as amphiphatic helix and the leucines in each one of these amphiphatic helix are arranged in such a way that they can actually form what is called as a zipper. That is these leucine resi residues interdigitate with each other and as a result these two monomers are brought together and the actual DNA binding is actually done by an adjacent region which is rich in basic amino acids. Okay. So, the leucine zipper is not directly involved in DNA binding, they actually bring the two monomers together by the interdigitation of the two leucine residues, series of leucine residues in this amphiphatic helices, so that the basic region can come together and this basic region can now recognize the DNA and facilitate DNA binding. Okay. And very important thing is that the leucine zippers can either facilitate homodimer formation or heterodimer formation. For example, if you, in the case of uh, uh, some transcription factor belong to C June family, there is a transcription factor called C June, which can either form a homodimer or in some cases it can also form a heterodimer with another leucine zipper protein called C FOS. Okay? So, you can have a C June C June homodimer or you can have a C June C FOS heterodimer. 
Okay. So, the leucine zippers can either form homodimer or, or they can form heterodimers. So, this again brings in diversity. So, the strength of a transcription signal response or the uh, diversity in transcription regulation by homodimer may be different from heterodimer and this itself can contribute to differential gene regulation. So, by facilitating either homodimer formation or heterodimer formation, differential gene regulation can be brought about by the Lucene zipper family of transcription factors. So, an important point to note when you talk about Lucene zipper family is that the Lucene zipper motif itself direct does not directly participate in DNA. Now, that is what I just told you. It actually facilitates in bringing the two monomers together and the leucine zipper form promote dimer formation so that the adjacent basic region can go and bind DNA. So, the DNA binding domain adjacent to the leucine zipper is the one that actually uh, uh, involved in the DNA binding. Now, the leucine zipper forms an amphiphatic ellipse in which the leucines of one protein protrude from an alpha helix and interdigitate with the leucines of the other protein in parallel to form a coil coil domain. And the region adjacent to the leucine repeats, which is highly basic, is the one actually that forms the DNA binding site. So, in fact, when you look at the leucine zipper protein, they actually look like scissors, okay, as, as is shown here. <coughs> The other important DNA binding motifs which have been discovered in many transcription factors is what is called as a helix loop helix motif. Okay. Remember this is different from the helix turn helix motif which we discussed earlier. Now, the amphipathic helix loop helix was actually identified in certain transcription factors involved in development regulation. Okay. Just like you, you found the helix turn helix motif also is important in many of the homodomain containing proteins, the helix loop helix also is a very important DNA binding motif which is involved in many transcription factors which play a very important role in development regulation of gene expression. And these transcription factors actually contain a stretch of about 40 to 50 amino acids which comprise about 2 alpha helices separated by a linker region or a loop of varying length. Now, again the helix loop helix proteins form both homodimers and heterodimers by means of interactions between hydrophobic residues on corresponding phase of two helices and the ability to form the heterodimers resides within these amphipathic helices. Most helix loop helix proteins contain a basic region adjacent to the helix helix motif that is involved in DNA binding and hence they are actually called as BHLH proteins. So, just as you have the B zip proteins where a basic region involved in inner binding is actually brought together or juxtaposed together because of facilitated by the dimerization of leucine zipper. Here, the helix loop helix proteins also contain a DNA binding motif which involves the basic region and therefore, just like you have the B zip proteins, you have a B HLH class of proteins. Some of the examples, these are very important proteins of which belong to this particular family of transcription factors are MyoD, MIF5 myogenin, MRF4, etc. And all these are very, very important transcription factors which all control actually muscle differentiation. So, difference during development, differentiation of cells into muscle cells actually involves turning on the expression of some of these important transcription factors and is these transcription factors which actually are important in converting the cells into cells of a particular lineage into skeletal muscle. So, many of the HLH family of proteins are involved in muscle differentiation. <coughs> now, there is a very, very nice review uh, on uh, uh, helix turn helix motif, zinc finger motifs and leucine zipper motifs by Kevin Stoll in Trends in Biochemical Sciences in the April 99 issue. So, I have not given all the details of all these key motifs. So, I have just mentioned uh, given you a overview of various motifs. So, if you want to learn a little bit more about how exactly all these motifs are organized, I strongly suggest you this very nice and simple review which was uh, uh, published in Trends in Biochemical Sciences or TIPS. <coughs> now, these although these four domains which I discussed so far are the most important or some of the examples of DNA recognition motifs, it do not uh, do not expect that all the uh, transcription factors actually fall only into those four categories. As we learn more and more about transcription factors binding to DNA, more and more novel DNA binding motifs have been identified and this just tells you there are at least about 33 different DNA binding motifs have been identified in various DNA binding proteins and transcription factors so far. Okay. You have homeobox, POW domain, what is called as a bromo domain and you have what is called as a mass box proteins which is called as a zinc ribbon proteins, run domain. I mean uh, you can just go on and on. So, do not uh, don't think that all the transcription factors should contain only these four kinds of DNA recognition motifs. These are just examples what I gave you. In addition to these four DNA recognition motifs, there are a number of other motifs which have been discovered in a number of transcription factors. Now, what I will do in the next maybe 10 or 15 minutes, I 
is to give you an example, a very simple example. Now, we have studied so far about proximal promoter elements, distal promoter elements, core promoter elements, RNA polymerase 2, general transcription factors, then upstream activators and then we discussed about how upstream activators go and bind to specific DNA sequences. Now, I thought you will understand better if I now discuss all these things I have told you so far with respect to one particular example. The simple example that I want to now do is to discuss with you gene regulation in yeast cells, how yeast cells respond to methanol. Okay? Now, normally as you know yeast cells are grown using glucose as a carbon source, right? The yeast like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, Baker yeast and so on and so forth. Normally, you want to grow yeast cells or even E. coli cells, you actually put glucose because glucose can be directly taken to glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport and you can generate lots of energy and many cells strains like Saccharomyces cerevisiae derive primarily by glycolysis and glucose is the most uh, ubiquitous and most favored carbon source not only by E. coli, but also by yeast and even higher organisms. Okay? Now, but there are certain yeasts which are actually called as methylotropic yeasts. Now, these methylotropic yeasts, instead of glucose, they can also use methanol as a carbon source. Okay? And there are at least four such yeasts belonging to the four genera Picea, Hansonella, Candida, and Torulopsis. So, they, unlike Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the Baker's yeast, it cannot use methanol as a carbon source. In fact, the cells will die. Whereas, these particular yeasts, in addition to glucose, can also use methanol as a carbon source. And it turns out, they can use methanol as a carbon source because they actually have a machinery for metabolizing methanol. Methanol can be converted to formaldehyde, formaldehyde can be converted to formic acid and so on and so forth. And during the series of reac reactions, NAD is converted to NADH and this NADH can then be used for generating ATP. Okay? So, methanol can be used for efficiently de 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 deriving energy and therefore, these uh, yeast actually have genes which code for enzymes which are involved in breakdown of methanol, what is called as a methanol utilization pathway, whereas Saccharomyces cerevisiae does not have it. Okay? But what is very interesting about gene regulation is concerned is that these genes which are involved in methanol metabolism, they are not normally expressed when you grow these yeast cells in glucose. The moment you change the carbon source from glucose to methanol, all these genes which are involved in synthesis of enzymes involved in methanol utilization pathway, they are all turned on. So, very interesting to now understand how does this particular gene switch is brought about? How does methanol induce the activation of promoters of genes which are required for methanol metabolism? Now, till recently, the transcription regulation by which these genes of methanol utilization pathway of pathway of methylotropic yeast is turned on is not very well understood. Now, it turns out the first enzyme which is required in the methanol metabolism is an enzyme called alcohol oxidase. The job of this alcohol oxidase is to break down methanol to formaldehyde. Okay? Now, this the reason I am stressing this particular uh, gene is that this alcohol oxidase promoter is widely used for making recombinant proteins. Now, in the previous class when you discussed about enhancer elements, I told you one of the major benefits of understanding promoters and transcription factor binding is our ability to produce recombinant proteins. You can produce recombinant protein any system of your choice. That is one of the major benefits out of understanding promoter DNA interactions, promoter protein interactions. right? Now, the alcohol oxidase promoter is one of the most widely used promoters for making recombinant proteins in yeast cells. Now, if you want to make large amounts of growth hormone or insulin or hepatitis B surface antigen, all that I have to do is I have to take the gene coding for these proteins and put in downstream of the alcohol oxidase promoter and put this plasmid in PKI pastoralis cells and you can grow this yeast in large amounts in glucose. As long as you grow the cells in glucose, this promoter is not turned on, therefore your recombinant protein will not be made. But the moment you change the carbon source from glucose to methanol, this promoter is activated and you get large amounts of your recombinant protein is made. In fact, the alcohol oxidase promoter is one of the most important eukaryotic promoters known. Almost 30 percent of the total cellular proteins is contributed by this one protein. So, large amounts of this alcohol oxidase is made when the carbon source is changed from glucose to methanol. But although a large number of such recombinant proteins are being made in the using this alcohol oxidase expression system, very little was known as to how exactly methanol is inducing the expression of these genes. So, you can see there are two situations. As long as you grow the yeast cells in glucose, the promoter is not turned on. But the moment you change the carbon source from methanol, glucose to methanol, all the genes are turned on. So, we are not again talking about one gene. 
that means there are about let us say about 6 or 20 genes. All these genes which are required for methanol metabolism have to be simultaneously turned on when you change the carbon source from glucose to methanol. What is actually told is that there must be a transcription factor just like for example in, in higher eukaryotic cells when you add a glucocorticoid hormone or estrogen hormone all the genes which have to be uh, activated in response to the glucocorticoid hormone or estrogen hormone has to be turned on. So, the estrogen receptor or glucocorticoid receptor in response to the hormone will now go and bind to the promoter regions of all these genes and activate the expression of all these target genes. In the same way there must be a transcription factor which must be going and binding to the promoters of all these genes which are required for methanol metabolism. So, such proteins are called as master regulators like you can actually call steroid hormone receptor is a master regulator because it just does not regulate one gene, but it regulates the expression of a number of genes involved in a specific pathway or a specific physiological response. So, in this particular case there must be a master regulator which must be activated when you change the carbon source from glucose to methanol. What is this master regulator was the question which was asked. <coughs> so, as I told you the alcohol oxidase promoter is widely used for expressing recombinant proteins and the alcohol oxidase encodes the first enzyme in the methanol metabolism and as long as you grow the spicia pastoris yeast cells in glucose or glycerol as a carbon source this promoter is not activated. But the moment you change the carbon source to methanol very high levels of this protein is made and in fact one of these one of the most potent eukaryotic promoters known. But a question that is to be asked is that how does methanol induce the expression of alcohol oxidase gene and other genes which are involved in methanol metabolism. Now, it is only recently in the year 2006 a group in United States actually identified a transcription factor which they called as MXR1P. Now, how exactly they identified I will not go into the details I suggest if you are interested you can actually read this particular issue of molecular and cell biology where they exactly go over and describe how exactly they identified this MXR1P which stands for methanol expression regulator 1 how they have actually identified this as a master regulator of methanol metabolism in picia pastoris cells. Now, what is interesting what they show in this particular paper is that this particular protein is a zinc finger protein. Now, it contains a C2H2 kind of a zinc finger there are two such zinc fingers and it is a huge protein which contains about 1155 amino acids, but the DNA binding domain which consists of two zinc fingers is present near the amino terminus of the zinc finger protein. And what they actually show is that this protein is expressed at very very low levels whether you grow this picia pastoris cells either in glucose or glycerol or methanol the protein is expressed. But remember the promoters are turned on only when you uh, change the carbon source to methanol. So, although this transcription factor is expressed all the time it is a activating transcription of the target genes only when the carbon source is changed from glucose to methanol. And it turns out how is this brought about it turns out as long as you grow this picia pastoral cells in either glucose or glycerol as a carbon source this MXR1P stays in the cytoplasm. But the moment you change the carbon source from glucose to methanol or glycerol to methanol this MXR1P now goes inside the nucleus just like the steroid hormone induces translocation of the glucocorticoid receptor from cytoplasm to nucleus somehow methanol is inducing the translocation of this MXR1P from cytoplasm to nucleus and once it goes inside the nucleus it is now going and binding to the promoters of the all the genes which are required for methanol metabolism and turning all the methanol metabolization pathway. So, what they have shown in this paper is that if you now delete the gene coding for MXR1P that is if picia pastoral cells cannot make MXR1P then they cannot metabolize methanol they cannot grow in methanol all the genes that are required for methanol utilization pathway are not expressed by just deleting one transcription factor clearly indicating that this transcription factor actually is the master regulator for activating all the genes of the methanol utilization pathway. But what this particular people in this particular paper had not shown is that how exactly this MXR1P goes and binds. Now, if the MXR1P has to function as a master regulator it has to now go and bind to specific elements in the promoters of not only alcohol oxidase which is the first enzyme in methanol metabolism it should also be binding to the promoters of various other genes which are also required for metabolizing methanol. For example, the second enzyme in the uh, is called as dihydroxyacetone synthase then you have what is called as a formaldehyde dehydrogenase formate dehydrogenase all these enzymes are required for the metabolism of methanol. So, you need to now identify how this MXR1P goes and binds the promoters of not only alcohol octase, but also the promoter regions of all the genes. 
That means, we need to go back to some of the two or three classes behind. I told you that we have to now understand how actually mxRNP binds to specific DNA sequences. So, now let us recapture some of the techniques that we discussed. Now, how do you go about and study transcription? How do you identify what kind of sequences the transcription factors goes and binds? I told you the two popular experimental techniques that people use for identifying transcription factor binding sites and promoters is electrophoretic mobility shift assay, DNA zone footprinting, etcetera. So, this is the techniques that we in our own laboratory actually is used to identify what kind of the sequences that this mxRNP goes and binds. Now, again I told you mxRNP again is a zinc finger protein and just as in any transcription factor it must be containing two domains. One is the DNA binding domain which contains two zinc fingers and somewhere in the rest of the protein there must be a transcription activation domain. Now, as is known for many transcription factors these two domains must be separable. That means, the DNA binding domain must be separable from the transcription activation domain. So, assuming that what is shown in that transcription factor should also be true for MXR1P, what we did is we took just because it is very, very difficult to express large proteins in equally cells because because a huge protein of 1155 amino acids. So, since we are at this point are interested only in understanding what kind of sequences the MXR1P actually recognizes we actually took a 150 amino acid region in the MXR1P protein which consists of the zinc finger region and over express them in E. coli cells. And you can see these are the E. coli cells which are all E. coli proteins, but if you now induce the expression of the uh, recombinant protein using what is called as the uh, um, uh, uh, lactose operon, lac operon using IPTG, you can see MXR1P is now made in large amounts and the MXR1P actually we have cloned it in such a way that it contains a histidine tag at the amino terminus and therefore, we can actually purify these proteins in large amounts by passing on this entire extract through what is called as a metal affinity column. So, you can make a nickel agarose column and if you pass all these proteins through nickel agarose column, only the histidine tagged MXRNP protein will bind to the column, rest of the proteins will come in the flow through and you can actually elude this protein from column and then you can see you can purify this protein. So, now I have a yeast transcription factor DNA binding domain in large amounts. Now, using large amounts of this MXRNP transcription factor, now we ask the question how does this transcription factor go and bind to specific regions of the promoter DNA? So, what I did? We did what is called as a electrophoretic mobility shift assay. Now, the alcohol oxidase promoter is about 1000 base pairs. Now, this 1000 base pairs is what everybody is using for making a large number of recombinant proteins. So, what I did? I took I took this alcohol access promoter because 1000 base pairs is too big a DNA fragment to do electrophoretic mobility shift assays. Usually electrophoretic mobility shift assays are done with DNA fragments of about 50 maximum 50 to 60 base pairs not more than that. So, what we did? We took this 1000 base pair region and divided them into about 12 different 60 base pair regions from minus 1000 to plus 1. This is what is shown here. 940 means it has the first 940 base pair from, uh, um, 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 from the 1000 to 940. Um, then you have 890 and so on. So, so the entire promoter region was different, uh, divided into 12 different or 16 different uh, promoter regions, each spanning a different region of the alcohol oxidase. And we radio labeled each one of these promoter fragments and then incubated with this MXR1P DNA binding domain, which was made in E. coli cells, and asked the question what kind of these promoter regions within the alcohol oxidase promoter is capable of binding M uh, MXR1P. And when you do this electrophoretic mobility shift assay, where you take the DNA and DNA protein complexes and run them on a R chromate gel and as I described in my previous class, when the DNA binds the protein, it becomes a bigger complex and therefore, its mobility is retarded in the gel. Therefore, you get a uh, slow moving complex and you see that is what is happening here. Not all these promoter fragments bind MXR1P. For example, 940 which actually contains 60 base pair region up to 940 base pairs of the promoter does not form any protein complex. Similarly, the <coughs> The 890 region, which is the next adjacent region in the promoter, makes a nice complex with MXR1P, so is the next 65 base pairs. Whereas, the next three different regions of AOX promoter do not interact with MXR1P, whereas two other regions interact, and so on and so forth. That means, in the entire alcohol oxidase promoter region, we have been able to identify about 2, 4, about 6 or 7 different regions where the alcohol oxidase, uh, where the MXR1P actually binds specifically. That means, we have identified about 6 different regions in the alcohol oxidase promoter where MXRNP actually can go and bind in a very specific manner. 
we have also now concluded demonstrated convincingly that this binding is very specific by using what is called as a competition. I told you in last class you can also do a competition experiments where we actually took for example, we know that this 890 actually binds MXR1 and P. So, we took this 890 and then if you now chase the complex with the uh, protein complex with same homologous probe, uh, it changes very well, but the heterologous probe do not change. That is those promoter sequences which do not bind MXR1P, they do not chase the protein complex, but those comp uh, DNA fragments which bind MXR1P, when you put excess amounts of those DNA, they very effectively chase. So, these kinds of experiments very clearly tell you that what you are actually measuring is a sequence specific DNA protein interaction. Only when you add the we have a radio label fragment, when you add a homologous amount, uh, excess amount of the same homologous DNA, it effectively changes binding, but in a way the excess amounts of a heterologous DNA fragment that is a fragment which does not bind, it does not chase. So, by using these kinds of studies, we actually identified there are about 6 different regions in the alcohol as a promoter where MXR1P can actually bind in vitro. Now, we still do not know whether the same 6 regions are also bound by uh, MXR1P in vivo. This is again we will discuss later, there are techniques called as chromatin immunoprecipitation and so on and so forth, by which you can actually identify whether the transfer factor which is binding to a DNA fragment in vitro, can the same region be bound by the actual promoter in inside the cells in vivo. This there are different techniques to study those things. For the time being remember using a recombinant MXR1P transcription factor DNA binding domain expressed in E. coli cells, we have been able to demonstrate that in the uh, in the alcohol oxygen one promoter MXR1P binds 6 different regions in the EOX1 promoter. We have also done what is called as a DNA1 footprinting studies, where for example, in this case we have taken this particular promoter region which is about 60 base pairs in length, usually transcription factors do not require 60 base pairs to bind usually they bind about 15 to 20 base pairs that is the usual sequence that is sufficient for a transfer factor to bind. So, in this 60 base pair is what we identified using MSA, there must be a much smaller region where actually the protein is binding. So, to identify within the 60 base pair region where exactly the protein is binding, we carried out DNA zone footprinting studies. For example, we have taken this particular fragment labeled either the top strand or the bottom strand and you can see and then carried out DNA zone footprinting studies which I explained in my last class and you can see in the absence of protein, DNA zone cleaves all over and generates all this band but when you incubate with protein, you can see it has created a very nice footprint and clearly telling that. So, this is the region in the entire 60 base pair region, in the 60 F5 base pair region, the MXR1P is binding somewhere in this region, which is what is giving a footprint. This is from the top strand, this is the bottom strand and in both the strands, MXR1P is able to make a contact. That means, it is recognizing it is binding to both sides of the DNA. So, using footprinting studies, we have actually identified and then once we identified a footprint, we actually made 20, 20 base pairs of this particular DNA oligo. So, all our earlier studies of MSA were done with 65 base pair sequences, but now you made only a 20 base pair oligonucleotide, double standard oligonucleotide and actually shown that yes, this 20 base pair DNA is good enough for MXRNP binding. So, we identified about 65 base pair regions, 6 different such regions by using MSA studies, then by using footprinting studies, we narrowed down to about 20 base pair region and now we actually show 20 base pair region in these 6 different regions can actually bind MXR1P. We have done lots of other studies to actually show it is very specific binding and so on and so forth. But then the interesting thing is, as I told you, MXR1P, if it is activating transcription of specific genes, it must be a sequence specific transcription factor. It cannot go and bind anywhere in the promoter. When I say it is binding to 6 different regions in the alcohol of this promoter, that means all these 6 regions must be having some common DNA elements. There must be some common recognition sequences in the 6 different regions which the alcohol which the MXRNP is able to recognize. So, once we identify 6 different regions the alcohol oxygen promoter which the MXRNP is binding, then we ask the question what is common in these 6 different regions. And interestingly we found out all these 6 different regions contain either a GGGG motif or a GG or GGGG motif or a GG purine G motif. <coughs> okay, you can see here, either they contain a CTCC or a CCCC motif and a, and, a, and a complementary sequence. So, the common sequence which is present in all these sequences is either a CTCC in one of the strands or a CCCC motif. So, what we said is that all the DNA for MXR1P to bind to a particular region the promoter, you require either a CYCC sequence, where Y is either a CRT. 
So, the top strand should contain C Y C C and the bottom strand should contain G G R G where R is a purine. So, we identified that M X R 1 p requires this particular as the core sequence for it to bind. Now, I am not going to more detail because what we actually shown is that in addition to the core sequence it also requires certain specific sequences flanking this particular core sequence for DNA recognition. But so, what we have shown is that MXR 1P is actually a sequence specific DNA binding proteins and the 6 different promoter regions which we have identified actually contain the same kind of sequence which contains either a C or uh, TCC or CCCC motif must be present for MXR 1P to bind. I will uh, there uh, when we are actually doing some of this experiment there is another group actually which actually published a paper they have actually deleted certain regions in the promoter region of AOX1 and then actually showed if you delete these regions you actually lose the ability of methanol to activate transcription from AOX1 promoter indicating that these regions are actually important for transcription activation of the methanol uh, methanol inducible activation of the AOX1 promoter. So, now we have identified 6 different promoter regions, we now, we now put these 2 stories together and ask the question do the promoter regions which this group has identified in using their in vivo studies do they actually contain binding sites for MXR1P. In fact, it turns out very interestingly for example, they have actually showed if you delete the region between minus 805 and minus 798 the promoter activity drops down only 60 percent of the normal. And very interestingly, this region actually contains one of the MXRNP binding sites we have identified, which we call as MXRE2. Similarly, in the, in, the, in, the, in the nucleic acid research paper, they have shown if you delete the region between minus 643 and minus 597, the promoter activity drops by 33 percent. And in fact, what we are sure is that this region actually contains one of the MXRNP binding sites we have identified. Okay, and so on and so forth. So, every deletion that these people have identified seems to be containing a MXRNP binding site. So, there is a very good correlation between the MXRNP binding site that we have identified in vitro and when you delete regions which contain these MXRNP binding sites, there seems to be a decrease in the promoter function suggesting that these binding sites actually serve as MXREs or MXR1P response elements in vivo. So, MXRNP may be binding to these specific regions and if you delete in these regions, you actually lose promoter activity. So, this is just the summary of what I told you. We have identified 6 different MXRNP binding sites in the alcohol access promoter regions which are all shown in red and I can see all of them contain either a GGGG or GAGG motif or, or the complementary is either a CTCC or CCC motif which is the commons in all, the, all of them and what is very interesting is that deletion of a, all, a, all these promoter regions uh, actually results in the drop in the promoter activity. For example, if you delete this particular region where the TCCC motive related there is a decrease in the 40 percent promoter activity. If you delete this particular region shown in the pink, there is only 67 percent of promoter activity whereas, if you delete this particular region, it uh, there is only 70 percent promoter activity is gone and this deletion in this region requires only 60 percent decrease in promoter activity, deletion here requires decre decreases 58 percent promoter activity is gone. <coughs> So, clearly indicating that it is possible that the binding sites we have identified in vitro may actually be serving as binding site for MXRNP in vivo as well. But more conclusive experiment needs to be done to actually show that MXRNP is actually binding to these regions in a native state or in the actual uh, in the nucleus of the actual cells. This how these studies are done we will discuss little bit later. We actually studied some of published many of these findings not only we have shown that this CTCC or CCCC containing motifs are present in the alcohol access promoter. These specific MXRNP binding sets are also present in two other promoters of the methanol utilization pathway namely dihydroxyacetone synthase as well as another gene called peroxinate. So, what we are proposing is that MXR when you change the carbon source from glucose to methanol, this MXR1P zinc finger protein translocate from cytosol to nucleus and then goes and binds to the promoters which must be containing these CTCC motifs. So, at least we have shown 3 promoters which are actually activated by methanol actually contain these kinds of MXRNP binding sites in their promoters. So, the MXRNP is binding as a global regulator by actually binding to these kind of motifs in the promoter regions of the various methanol utilization pathway genes and activating the expression of these target genes. So, I think I will stop here and uh, what I have told you so far <coughs> is that we have discussed in detail how these sequence specific transcription factors go and bind to DNA they contain a DNA binding domain and transcription activation domain. We will talk about transcription activation domain in the next class, but today's class we focus primarily on the DNA binding domain. We discussed various DNA binding domains which are present in transcription factors. 
like the helix turn helix motif, zinc finger motifs, helix loop helix motif, leucine zipper and so on and so forth. Okay? And then I told you there may be many other transcription factor by DNA binding motifs as well. And then I briefly gave an example of our own research in our own laboratory where we actually identified the binding site for a transcription factor called MXR1P in the promoter region of an alcohol oxidase 1 promoter which is the target gene and using techniques such as electrophoretic mobility shift assay and DNA zone footprinting how we went about and identified the binding sites for a specific transcription factor. Now, one can study this kind of studies using any eukaryotic promoter of your choice. I think I will stop here.